those that are joining us, our panelists today are Cynthia Manning, uh, Joanna uh, uh, Phelan, and Terrence Kessie. Um, and please correct my pronunciation if any of that is wrong. Um, but they are members of our uh, Rallet Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission. Uh, so they do hold regular meetings uh, on, on various issues um, and topics. And so they will be the ones fielding our questions today. And with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Like I said, we're going to keep these to four minutes uh, here in the panelist discussion. Let me go ahead and get my um, stopwatch up. Apologies. That way I can ensure that we're staying true to time. And we will go ahead and get started. So I'm recording. Uh, my first question for the panelists is, what does inclusive organizing in your neighborhood look like to you? Uh, and so I will take an answer from any of the three panelists if you guys maybe want to just hop in. Again, the question is, what does inclusive organizing in your neighborhood look like to you? Okay, good morning. I'll go ahead and start, All um, right. if you don't mind. Um, so four minutes, right, on each question? Okay, so I'll just um, add my thoughts. Um, for inclusivity in our community, um, my opinion is for everyone to feel valued, respected, safe, and that um, they belong. It's their home, it's their community, and to establish those relationships with one another um, to bring all of those aspects together. I guess if someone else wants to answer. I believe that it means that, you know, we all are actually working together to try to make our community the community that we want it to be. A community that does make us feel safe, that does make us feel like we belong, and one that um, is able to embrace all of our differences and bring us all together um, to be a stronger community and one that is uh, fully open to accepting all of the members of that community. I, I think that is um, what it's all about. And uh, Terrence, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that was part of the reason why I initiated our uh, group here in Rowlett and Waterview. It's because we can take the collective strengths of each and every person because we all are, we all are unique. We all have um, particular skill sets and giftings and when we put those things together it's like um, to me that is what true community is about because when we commune with one another and we can uh, talk about our different uh, uh, vast backgrounds you know we're able to not just necessarily assimilate but we can all appreciate uh, one another from uh, an inclusive aspect so I agree with what uh, Joanne and Cynthia said. Excellent. Thank you guys for your answers. And like I said um, to the group, as we've had a couple more people join us, um, the questions that I'm posing to the panelists, um, uh, I have pretty written down here, but if you do have any follow-up questions, um, please feel free to shoot them in the chat and we can kind of... Um, uh, tag them on at uh, the back end of these questions. So thank you panelists for the answers for that one. Uh, we'll go ahead and move forward a little under that four minute time. So kudos to you guys. Uh, our second question is, what are some reasons why knowing your neighbors is important to you? Uh, so important to you as a neighbor, as a community member, uh, what are some of those important reasons? And I see uh, Cynthia, you've unmuted first. So I'll go ahead and give it to you. Okay, so I can um, think back uh, to a point in time when I realized exactly how important it is to know your neighbors and to have a little background information on them. Um, I received a visit by the police in a previous uh, community. I received a um, police were at my door at about one in the morning asking questions about uh, my neighbor next door. I didn't know her very well. We would speak, you know, sometimes when we saw each other, but she was pretty private. I only knew a few things about her. And so at that point in time, I wasn't very much help to the police who were trying to locate her to um, minor children. Um, come to find out that she had been um, tragically killed in an auto accident. 
And they were trying to locate her children who actually were at home in the house. The only thing I knew about her was that she worked for the post office. And that was the only information I could provide to, to the police to um, try to figure out where the kids were. Uh, but with that information, they were able to actually contact her ex-husband who also worked at the post office. And he was able to come over and retrieve his children that were actually in the home. So that was something that kind of spurred us in our neighborhood at that time to actually start doing, um, you know, like block parties and things like that, just to kind of start to find out who it is that we're living around, just because we, in those types of situations, you just don't know where to go. And it even helped us to, um, we compiled a list of all the neighbors on the street just so we would have a contact information for those people, just in case the emergency arose. You just never know what's going to possibly happen. So I, I felt like in that time frame, if I, I had known a little bit more about my neighbor, it would have been a lot more helpful. But um, it was definitely a lesson learned for me. Wow, that's a great, that's a great little anecdote there. Uh, Cynthia, I really appreciate that. Um, jo uh, yes, Joanna. I'd like to add on to what Cynthia said. Um, when we moved into our community, the need was for us to communicate with our neighbors to let them know who we are. Um, not only personally, but professionally, I work with special needs children and special needs families. So I felt it was extremely important, like what Cynthia was saying, to communicate with my neighbors to let them know that my child has special needs. Um, and when he started middle school, a, the concern was there because he elopes. So I needed my neighbors to know that if they saw my son walking down the street, that's my son, please contact me. And sure enough, it did happen. And so right away, since we were new to the community, that was my family's need for not only the school to know that he will elope or my neighbors to know, please contact me, here's my information. And uh, if you need any help, I'm here to help you as well. And that's that's what we did. So thank so you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank yeah. you, Joanna. Yeah. And, and Terrence, I, I saw that you came on mute there for a second, if you'd like to add as well. we got time. Oh, okay. So um, part of the reason I think we need to know one another is, again, from that personal uh, story, we all have been impacted in some way. And so when we lived in Florida about eight years ago, um, both myself and my wife on separate occasions with our children we were approached by an individual who in, in, he basically gave us an inquisition on why are you in this neighborhood? Mm. And it was like, well, I live here. And he even went on to ask um, ridiculous questions like, well, you must make a lot of money or I mean, this and that. And I just couldn't believe what was going on. Now we had no organized type uh, structure as far as a neighborhood program. And so when we moved here, um, Part of the reason why I helped, you know, create a program is because we need to know one another to help not only to prevent people from assuming, but also to allow for a platform that mm -hmm. invites one another to be able to say, hey, let me learn about this person instead of let me assume what I don't even know and make my, in my own judgment about this person. So that's part of why I think it's, it's a need. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Those are, those, that was really powerful answers there. Um, we'll move on to our third one, and that was right on time. That was perfect. Um, and our third question is, what are some ideas for Rowlett, Garland, and Plano residents to start organizing their neighborhoods? And so perhaps, I know, Terrence, maybe you can start us off. Actually, you were talking about how you've kind of implemented somewhat of a similar uh, program. Can you, can you walk us through kind of the steps, um, you know, and, and how you did that to organize them will kind of bounce around the panelists. Absolutely. So uh, it, it was very simple. I, we have a, a neighborhood Facebook presence and social media presence. And so um, I was speaking with my wife about it and I said, hey, let's do something. And I, I don't know what it is, but it all kind of stemmed from, um, you know, uh, the George Floyd incident on last year. And so I reached out via the social network and said, hey, who's interested in starting something? Because I believe that 
when we are more neighborly or when we begin to learn one another one to one, mm -hmm. it's harder for someone to have any type of bias against a, a person the more you get to know them. And so I asked people to raise their hands and a few people did. And, you know, we had brainstorming sessions, you know, uh, about a month or so before we kicked off our first event. And really the first event was about to help us to, to get the word out and to spread what we want to do um, and allow for other people to possibly join. And so it just kind of blossomed from there. And so those are kind of the beginning phases for us. Perfect. Um, Joanne, I see you're, uh, you're unmuted. Did you want to add anything to that? And then we'll finish with Cynthia. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. But sure, I'm, oh, going, it's okay. to, I'm going to add if you don't mind. <laughs> no, um, no problem. I love the way uh, Garland, Rowlett, and uh, Plano have established this here today, um, especially with working with the RDIC um, being on that committee. We are able to mimic what we see the cities doing, how they learn from one another. Then we're able to take some of those resources and use them in our own HOA or just use them in our own neighborhood and background um, backyards. Because watching these um, presentations today, I see what Plano is doing. I see similarities with Rowlett, but we as an HOA have used some of those resources too. And so I love how we are just learning from one another. And just like with the opportunities that Terrence provides as well. I like that. Perfect. Thank you. And, and Cynthia, you want to wrap us up there? We got a couple minutes, minute and a half. Okay. So I would say um, it just kind of starts with just one person. If one person uh, makes the effort to reach out to one other person, you can really start a dialogue and it will move forward. And um, earlier in the year, we were discussing different ways of trying to get to know our neighbors and ways for us to actually just kind of open up the lines of communication. And um, I, I had seen this done in some other communities, so it's not a new concept, but I had put together a, a little bag. So it's got like little treats and little snacks and um, I put a little card on it and it's like, hi neighbor. And then to kind of, uh, you can write notes, you can um, just kind of give a little bit of information about yourself, just make an introduction. Uh, drop it on their doorstep and um, other neighborhoods I think are calling it you've been neighbored or uh, something to that concept and so it's something that once you get it from a neighbor then you pass it on to the next so it's like a pay it forward type of scenario that works to kind of break the ice and kind of do the introductions without you having to walk over and knock on the door and just introduce yourself if you're not you know inclined to do so. So it's just different options. It just starts with one person making that step to try to get to know their neighbor. And I think you can be really effective in that. Yeah, I love that. Kind of like a neighbor gram of sorts in a, in a, in a way. Um, and just a reminder to those listening in with us today, um, feel free to follow up, you know, provide any follow-up questions in the chat. I'd be happy. Some of these um, some of our answers might be a little short, some of them might be a little long, and so we'll make the time work out. So if you do have anything on your mind, please uh, feel free to send that in. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead and move on to question number four. We're gonna come, we're gonna go right up to the 12 o'clock um, hour and then have a 10 minute Q&A following that. So if we bleed over a little bit, no worries. Uh, so question number four that I have is, can you talk about a time where you tried to organize a neighborhood event and it went poorly um, and how did you overcome that? Because, you know, sometimes that can be discouraging for folks. Uh, they try it once, it doesn't work, and they just say, ah, never mind. And so um, is there, do you have an example of a, of a poor, poorly gone, inter, you know, initiation of neighborhood um, events? And I'll kind of pose that to the panel. So whoever would like to, to hop in can. I don't mind going first on that one, only because, you know, we were very, um, we try not to be too uh, aggressive, but at the same time, you know, we wanted to have monthly events um, in our neighborhood. And so some went really well, some not so well. So for example, we host things like yoga um, or different um, dance opportunities or treasure hunts or, you know, paint day, we're having um, a friend's Thanksgiving, um, 
And the, the side, the, the piece where it did not go so well is last year, we, of course, and this year, we are continuing with the social distancing aspect of it with COVID. And so um, we're always having to really think about how can we have an event um, with uh, some social distancing in play. And so the majority of our events were held outside. Um, we can't control the weather, especially here in Texas, right? And so um, what we would have to do is modify at some um, aspect. And so what we do, we learn, um, you know, our, our mistakes to be sure that either we have a, another plan in place or sometimes not to force it, where we can say, you know what? Let's just um, postpone the event and let's move to the next occasion because we've had those where only the um, those who, the members actually were there, and so uh, the, those are some of the learning pieces. It's okay to adjust on the fly, and then you learn from those. So that's just a, a little snippet. That's perfect, Terrence. Thank you, uh, Cynthia or Joanna. Do you guys want to jump on? We got a couple minutes for this one. Um, I would say um, in some instances um, in another community, I um, wanted to organize things with the neighbors and just came to the conclusion that things just didn't come together very well as far as surrounding my home. But um, it just, my home just wasn't the place that people like to gather or, you know, hang out or my yard for that matter. So just based on the structure of the house and the location, it just wasn't conducive to that type of environment. But what I did realize was that my neighbor across the street had this large open space in the front yard and it was perfect. You put up volleyball nets, you could do this, that and the other. And so we started utilizing their house as the place where people would actually gravitate to so I just had to understand in that point in time that my home wasn't the location so it wasn't about that the thing was in changing the location it actually worked out better and more people were receptive to it and it worked out time and time again so sometimes it's just rethink a little bit of it and just kind of see what may be behind, you know, the lack of participation and just tweaking a couple of little things may help to actually bring your initial concept together. Yeah, I love that. I think that's great advice. Um, Joanna, anything you'd like to add? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, combining the two of what they've said, with our events, um, we have found that it's, it is about location. So you always have to have a backup plan. The holiday event that we're planning coming on uh, you know, soon, um, we're anticipating, okay, what if there's changes in the weather? So we're accessing our school that's here nearby. Um, since we can't organize maybe in someone's home and we don't have another centralized location, the closest thing is going to be for us to, to utilize our school, which is great because our kids go to those, you know, the school down the street. Um, and they also have a playground there. So we're able to access those resources that are close to our community that people are more willing to go to. Their kids are there every day. And it's just, it's, it's a great bonding experience for us to meet the, you know, the teachers and, and everyone else in this area. That's great. Thank you guys. Yeah, just kind of using the resources that are, that are there and the assets that you have as a group. Um, to capitalize on what you guys are, the end goal of what you're looking to do. So that's great. Uh, Deborah, I do see your, your uh, comment in the chat. So I'll bring that up first thing whenever we get through these last couple questions um, as it relates to uh, Cynthia's little neighbor gram program. Um, question five for us. Oh, go ahead, Terrence. Can I add one more thing to that? Sure, yeah, absolutely. One of the learning curves we did have was pulling permits. So just if you're going to try to start something, be sure you understand the different city ordinances or what have you, because, you know, we did have an event where we had, you know, food trucks and all those things and the city came over and we were like, uh oh, we're so sorry, please forgive us. So just be sure that you're mindful of that. That's great advice, Terrence. Yeah, that's wonderful, because that you guys are calling my office typically is how that works. <laughs> that's great advice. Um, the next question I have is. Share with us the impact inclusive organizing has had 
on relationships between you and your neighbors. Uh, and so again, that's just uh, the impact that inclusive organizing uh, amongst all of your neighbors has had on your relationship with them. Um, and I'll open that up to anybody that would like to kind of jump in first. Um, looks like Cynthia might be looking for the unmute button. Yes, she was, okay. <laughs> So um, I, I think it's been um, enlightening, actually, just being able to interact and get to know a little bit more about my neighbors. Everyone has a, a different aspect to bring to the party, so to speak. And uh, it's been really good because we um, are able to actually share our ideas. And when things are going on in the community, whether it be something that's positive or negative, we've actually been able to provide each other with information that helps us to resolve issues and things like that when um, we have certain situations arise. So I think it's just been extremely important because you know sometimes, um, I know several years ago, there was a storm here in the Rowlett area that was um, a, a major you know, storm and it did a lot of damage and uh, and those times you really need to know the people that are around you because at that point you can actually share that information. They can contact, if someone's home didn't survive, but yours did, they could reach out to you and find out possibly the status of, you know, their home or have someone to kind of look out for their home just in case there's looters and things like that. So I think it's extremely important to just, have those communications, open line of communication, because you don't know what serious event could happen that um, you might need to all pull together to, to work it out. So that's what I found valuable. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Joanna, if you would like to, yeah, there you go. So I wanted to jump on this also because um, it's so important that we're able to learn what each person in the community brings to the table. So for our HOA, we were able to divide our submit. We have a social committee. So we're able to divide uh, our subcommittee in areas of people's strengths. So one, um, two people will do decorations. Another two will do food. Another uh, two people will do location. And very important to what Taryn said, our experience was you do have to understand what city ordinances are out there. And for the city of Rowlett, we had to apply um, and able to use the resources, that block party trailer that's available, um, to be able to use the school, to be able to have that block party trailer at the school. Um, there was certain processes and steps that we had to go through. And each of us in our committee were able to learn all of that information and then understand who best was going to be able to communicate that need for our um, events. So uh, yeah, definitely understanding who can do what best and finding out the resources, because a lot of this has to be done like Terrence says, once a month, well, maybe that doesn't work, but for us, it's going to be once every quarter. So we have to be knowledgeable about what we're doing and learn. Absolutely, and then Terrence, if you wanna wrap that one up for us. Yes, you know, one of the things I learned about the whole getting to know your neighbor better is you go into it with an open mind and it, it, it truly allows for you to begin to remove uh, the doubt about who, or remove the, the, um, the biasness, if you will. Because one thing I learned was that some will be your friends, some won't. I mean, you're gonna have those who you have a mutual respect for, and that's okay, because it's better than the doubting if you will, because it's the unknown, it's the uncertainty about your neighbor. But, you know, now, you know, if I walk or run through the neighborhood, you know, instead of someone yelling at me, you know, um, they actually still may yell, but it's more of a, what's up, Terrence? Hey, how are you? You know, so it feels really good uh, to learn more and more about your neighbors and also, again, to help remove some of those unconscious bias um, that you may have toward uh, someone for any reason. Yeah, Terrence, I think that's a great point about um, just being neighborly doesn't mean that you always have to like each other or get along, I guess, you know, and that there is there is a mutual respect there that you can gain for each other. Um, 
for whatever reason it may be. And I, I think that's actually, that's a great point. Um, I really like that. Um, so the, the last question that I have written down, at least, and it looks like our timing is just about perfect, is um, what are some educational or physical tools that all neighborhood leaders should know about when organizing neighborhood events or programming? And so these are the actual tangible, um, or maybe not so tangible, but tools that you guys have used um, to execute on planning these things, on making sure that they're successful. Um, Joanna, I see that you've unmuted first, so I'll go ahead and let you answer that. We had to find the most simple um, resource available and something free because we didn't have any money to uh, develop, you know, for our data, if, if you will. Um, in our HOA, we have, you know, up to 200 homes and we wanted to figure out, okay, how, what do our community members want to do? What are the events that they're interested in? What time of day um, on the weekends during the week? Uh, do they have kids? What are the demographics of our, of our neighborhood? Um, so we used Google Docs and we were able to create a QR code. We had an event, people were able to access that QR code and they had simple questions there. So that's how we got our data. We did the same thing with the RDESC, sending out the survey. Um, so like I said, we've been learning these resources, what are, what's happening in the cities. We're mimicking those ideas in our own HOA and we don't have money to buy the survey you know, data resource, but we are able to use Google Docs and that's what we did. And then we're able to then give that to our property management group. And then they're able to send out that um, uh, survey for more data if we need it. Excellent. Yeah. Terrence, if you'd like to hop on, I see you got unmuted a little first there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's the collective resources of those who are in the neighborhood. You know, just like we have the different businesses around us, those same people in our neighborhood are those who are running those businesses or, you know, those who are interactive within those business. So, you know, for example, you know, we had a person who's a graphic art designer, like everything that we have posted on our webpage, it's free because we had, you know, someone in the neighborhood to work on that, you know, a, a planner, you know, we have somebody who had an expertise in that. We even have agents. Um, so just you take the collective expertise of everyone and then you, like, like John was saying, you find those resources um, that are, are either free or come at a very nominal cost. And now, and we did open it up to donations. You know, for example, when we wanted to do a food drive or a clothing drive or, or when we have um, an event where we want to have raffles or what have you, we're just asking people. Normally, we don't charge for the events. But if you want to, you know, and the whole point behind the raffle is to, is to give away something that's going to benefit someone in the community, like a needy, uh, a, a family that's in need of what have you. So, um, yeah, that's it. That's great. That's great. Cynthia, if you want to kind of wrap up that question for us. Um, I think it's important first to uh, kind of understand how and what the best line of communication is for your neighborhood. If everyone is social media and you have a social media platform that will get the information out, we'll definitely use that platform to inform and to gather information as well. I think it's important to kind of look around us and see what's there. Find out if any of the local businesses are willing to support your neighborhood in your efforts. Sometimes, you know, um, Believe it or not, people still like raffles a lot. So if you can get local businesses to actually donate a gift card or a service or something to that effect, I mean, those are the things that tend to draw people in and, you know, because it's the possibility of gaining something from it. So that becomes one of those things that, you know, is just kind of, kind of beating the pavement also works still just because some of those basic things that, um, people go for are just still available to us. It's just a matter of figuring out how to get to those resources and how to communicate that information out to the community. I mean, you can come up with other uh, concepts and little trinkets and things that you can just uh, distribute um, just to kind of get an idea of what everyone wants to do in the community. And I think that's, you know, where you start. And you never know where you can go with that. 
yeah, I think those are great answers. It seems uh, it's one of the some of the best resources for everyone to use are those that are free, um, and, and but effective. You know, just because it's free does not mean it's not effective. So that's you know that's I think a really great message. Um, so with that, that's all of my pre-planned questions that I have for you guys. I did have one follow up from um, Deborah Bradford for Cynthia in regards to your kind of neighbor gram. It seems that that was somewhat well liked. Um, and the question was, do you start with one neighbor and uh, ask them to make another gram and then give it to a different neighbor and so on? And, and how do you know if it is successful? Have you asked around to see if that was, did, do you guys get the neighbor gram yet kind of thing? Or how did, how did that work for you? It actually does work and you figure out pretty quickly that um, it's being effective because you do add a notation, you know, to you, you're it. It's kind of the game of you're it. Okay, now that you've been neighbored, now you've got to neighbor someone else. And so actually, um, I've seen it work where it will kind of spiral. Someone will start it again and during a different time of year. So like Thanksgiving is coming up. So someone may put together a little fall, you know, little basket or something to that effect and start it all over again. And it actually just kind of, you know, it turns into a, a regular um, thing that people are like, hey, it's my turn to do this. So let me make this happen. So um, it just starts with one, but add a notation on the card or, you know, whatever you put on there and add a notation that, you know, you're it, you know, pass it on pay it forward. This is the next thing going. So I find that when I'm going through fast food locations, this, that, and the other, and sometimes someone's paid it forward and it's like, hey, your meal is free today. And it's awesome. So then I'm like, well, that happened for me, then I need to do that to reciprocate uh, for the next person. And so many times you'll see that that, that um, one act continues on throughout the day and it just helps to bring out about a spirit of, you know, uh, just being together and just being uh, a part of something bigger than just ourselves. I think that's the key. Yeah, I love that. I think that's really effective. Um, I think that's a simple yet effective way. Um, as Terrence was saying, that kind of comes at a nominal cost um, for everybody, um, you know, might even have the supplies laying around already to do it. So I think that's, that's a great effective thing. Thank you, Deborah, for the follow-up question. Um, I don't have any other follow-up questions, but we do have a couple minutes. Um, if our panelists would like to say anything else, uh, for the most part, we've gotten through our questions. Uh, just to kind of recap for everybody that might be joining us a little later, um, it really is about uh, you know mobilizing and using the resources that are available to you. Um, I know just kind of a shameless plug for the city of Rowlett folks, at least, the um, block party trailer is always available. Uh, well, maybe not always available, but it is available to be requested. I apologize, my dog is being noisy. Um, and so that, that I apologize, everybody. Uh, the neighborhood planners are going to kill me for seeing this recording, but um, that that is a resource that is available to our citizens in Rowlett. Um, I'm sure that the our neighbor cities, Plano, Garland, have an, another similar program. Um, but with that, I'll kind of open it up to the panelists for any closing remarks, um, if they would like to add anything before we check out here. You know, I'd like to um, add. I was last weekend um, in our neighborhood. There was a block party on our particular street, and I mean, I was amazed. They go all out. So they got the trailer from um, Rowlett Parks and Rec, and uh, they had a live band, <laughs> bounce houses, they set up tables and chairs, and I mean, just food, you name it. They, they had it together, and I was, wow, that's a spirit of, you know, just coming out, and all the neighbors were welcome. And so, you know, as the time went on, you know, and more people joined in, it was just amazing, you know, just to see the turnout and just all the different pieces to it. So um, I had to applaud them for their efforts and just bringing everything together. Yeah, I love that. Terrence, I saw you had unmuted there as well. Yeah, what I was going to say was 
just know that you can't do it all by yourself. And it, it, you need to take time for yourself every so often. And also because we have such a large community, I can speak on, on our behalf because we have over 2000 um, residents here in Waterview. And because we're so large, there is a, a great opportunity where you have other people who have kind of little silos, um, where you have little small divisions within neighborhoods who are hosting different things, or you have other people who are, who are out there in the community doing some really positive things. So that was one of our learning points where we said, hey, everybody can continue to have their own um, committee, if you will, or have your own program, but ever so often, let's join powers and let's come together. And one of our most successful uh, events took place when we did, when we all kind of came together and we had a couple hundred people to show up. I mean, it was a phenomenal time and we really got to learn one another and that was towards the end of last year. And so we're going to continue to have that as a quarterly thing where we can kind of come together. I love that. And Joanna, I'll give it to you for the uh, last couple of minutes here, if you'd like. Yeah, just want to mention your neighbors are your greatest resource. So making those connections, establishing those relationships with others, um, it's all valued. So most definitely. That's it. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I want to thank all of our uh, participants, our panelists, uh, especially for hanging in there with us today on a Saturday. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to everybody that was listening in with us. Um, we're right at the, at the 1210. Um, thank you, Timothy. He says, my dog is very cute. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, noisy as well. Um, so please head back to the main room uh, for just some closing remarks. Uh, and then I believe the, the summit in general will be wrapping up pretty soon after that. Uh, and so I do appreciate all y'all's time. Remember, all of our resources today will be posted for y'all's um, gathering and any, any other information, as well as the recordings will also be available if you'd like to share some of the information with uh, some of your other community members. So I uh, thank you guys so much, and I'll see you guys back in the main room.